Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you out to service this morning. If you're glad you're in church this morning, say amen. amen. Let's all stand if you would. Take your hymn books and turn to number 19. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Amen. Number 19. Aren't you thankful for the blood this morning? Amen. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's face, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty state, lose all their guilty state, lose all their guilty state, and sin. Rejoice to see that fountain in his day, and there may I, the vile as he, wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away, dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power, till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more, be saved to sin no more, be saved. To say no more till the ransom church of God be saved to sin no more. Ere sins 
by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing rooms reply. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die, and shall be till I die, and shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. When this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, lies silent in the grave, lies silent in the grave. This poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave. Brother Paul Hatch, would you pray over our service for us, please? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you humbly. Father, anticipating something from you this morning, Father. Thank you for everybody that's here today, Father. Thank you for bringing us into our midst, Father, that we can worship together. We want to magnify you, Father. We want to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, may we just make you who you say you are, God of everything. Amen. Oh, Father, we just ask today that if there's one today that doesn't know you as personal Savior, they'll trust your Son, Jesus, as their Savior today. And they can have that freedom that we so love, we love to have. Father, I think of the ones that are home today that can't make it, that couldn't make it. I think of Brother Lott in the hospital right now. Father, may you, your hand be upon him. May the healing hand of you touch his body and heal him today, Father. Be with him, comfort him. Comfort Chloe right now as well. We think of many more that are sick and at home today. May you be with them as well. Father, we just ask you to take over the service. Be with our pastor. Fill him with your yes. power and your spirit, Father, that we can have what you have for us today through him. Thank you for our, our pastor. Thank you for the man of God that stands behind the pulpit, preaches truth to us. We ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Yes. Amen. You may be seated. Turn to 140. We'll, we have an anchor. 140 this morning. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. It is safely moored where the storm withstand, for it is well secured by the Savior's hand. Though the tempest rage and the wild winds blow, will an angry way show our bark or foe. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. When our eyes behold through the gathering night, the city of gold, our harbors bright, we shall anchor fast by the heavenly shore with the storms all past forevermore. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Thank you for your good singing.
Amen. I'm glad we have an anchor. I love what the scripture says. You are kept by the power of God unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. I'm glad I have a keeper. And God saved me when I was very young, and he's keeping me in his hand. I'm glad I'm saved today. Are you glad you're saved? Hopefully you can say that. And uh, we're glad you're here at Independent. You've come on the Lord's Day to worship together. I pray the service would be an encouragement to you. If you're one of our regulars, we're glad you're back. And if you're uh, one of our snowbirds, I've seen some faces I haven't seen for a while. I'm glad to have you back. Uh, As this season continues and the church begins to fill up with more activity and more fellowship, I love the sound of fellowship before the services. Sometimes it's loud fellowship. Have you guys noticed that? That's wonderful. It doesn't sound dead in here, and that's a good thing. As the church begins to fill up towards this fall and even towards the spring, uh, let's work together if we can, to help people as they come in. If folks are looking for a seat, don't be afraid. Uh, Okay, I'll just say this. It's nobody here but us and the Lord. Um, So we're a family. If somebody's looking for a seat and there's seats beside you, don't be afraid in the middle of a song or even something's going on. Just, hey, why don't you come sit with us? And Brother Scott's helping me with ushering. And if we have to move together and, and scoot together, we are currently in the process of working to expand the sanctuary. That's what some of this uh, dust is going on behind us. I hope it doesn't bother your allergies too much. Um, they were able to drop the baptismal into its new resting place. Some, some people thought that was a grave. We're not, that's not a grave underneath the new platform or a time capsule. That's where our baptismal is going, and now it is there to rest. And so pray with us as that project continues. There will be phases and stages that maybe even require some unconventional settings with seating, Um, and we're looking forward to having a big push maybe even right after missions conference. So pray with us about that, getting connected with the right help, uh, some drywall people and some different things, and uh, pray pray for us as we as we move forward in that. We'd like to, there's a there's a model on the back wall, we're going to try and get close to that, okay? And that's that's our goal. So if you look at that, that tells you where we're headed. Uh, I do have a couple of people to keep in prayer this morning. Do pray for Brother Wayne Mott, taken to the hospital yesterday, admitted, probably just for a day or two. Just pray for him. There's an infection in his body, uh, systemic, and so they're pray- they're working on him. Pray for his dear wife, Cleo, uh, while he's in the hospital, and she- she's uh, taking care of him and then trying to get back and forth. Not real confident on the roads. Any you guys been on the roads lately? Um, yeah, it's a little crazy at times. And uh, so pray for, pray for uh, them. Also pray for Gary and Linda Kurz. Came down sick last week and just been working to get over that. Pray for both of them. Pray for Melinda. Chronic health problems that she has, unable to attend some services. And then for Brother Spangler's wife, Sharon. Um, she's, has some, she's in fragile health. Pray for her. When we see her, it's a blessing. Uh, but she has some difficult days. And pray for him as, he's her, as he is her caregiver. Uh, Miss Rita Smith, uh, not doing so well today, and her husband is out of town. Steve is out of town preaching down in LaBelle. Pray for him to have safety on the roads, and uh, that church down there needs a pastor. So pray for, pray for that situation. And then Miss Diana Ayers, uh, Brother Jerry's wife. Good to see you, brother. Uh, please continue to keep Miss Diana in prayer. I know there's others. We'll mention those on Wednesdays and in our prayer group. I want to remind you, uh, we have a messenger chat about the church And if you're a part of that messenger chat, don't be afraid to even send messages at 1 a.m. if you're up and struggling and need prayer. Um, If, if, By the way, if that noise keeps you awake and you don't want it to, turn off the volume on your phone. Some people are awake at that time and they need prayer. And so put it in there. Don't worry about it, okay? Manage that. Don't let it get out of hand. Uh, That group is for church business only, so don't post other stuff in there that doesn't have anything to do with church. If you need prayer requests or church announcements or praises to the Lord, that's, that's what that's for. And then we, have a, uh, we also have a prayer group. It's a closed group on Facebook. If you do social media, we can get you connected with that. Um, I do have a, an announcement. There's a, there's a plaque on the back board there. Miss Gloria Urbanowski works with Lighthouse Ministries for the Blind, and it's a community group. Um, they need volunteers. Uh, if, you, if you're available and want to be helpful in that community, stop by and take a look at that, and maybe, you can, um, maybe the Lord can use you there couple of announcements regarding upcoming events here at the church. Friday, October 28th is Heartland Youth Fellowship. That will be at Heritage Baptist Church in Arcadia, potentially. They did some stain some damage, 
and they're scrambling to get things back in a semblance of order. Pastor Bedell, bless his heart, the church barely had power, still had leaky roofs. He got those students right back in there like just in a couple days. We were over there putting roof on and he had a couple students in there instructing them and getting school back going. I don't think DeSoto County is going to go for another couple weeks. So their kids are still out of school, but Dr. Bedell said, we're not. And he got his kids back to school. They need a semblance of uh, some normalcy. Pray for them. And then the beginning of our missions conference is coming up in November, November 2nd through the 6th. And there's a, there's a slide here on the overheads as you come in. This is Missions Emphasis Month, and I'll be preaching about missions today. And so be in prayer for our upcoming missions conference. In fact, you say, Pastor, I'm not sure how to pray for missions. Well, if you thought that, that's a good thing because tonight I'll be preaching on that. So come this evening, we'll talk about praying for missions and how we can pray more directed. Good singing this morning. Let's keep singing. I'm going to turn it back over to our song leader, Brother Sam. You guys are doing a fantastic job singing this morning. Let's all turn our hymn books once again. 173, Love Lifted Me. Aren't you thankful for the love of God this morning? Amen. Amen. Did I ever found this? 173 in your hymn book. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I'll cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best song. Faithful, loving service to, to him me long. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Souls in danger look above. Jesus completely saved. He will lift you by his love out of the angry way. He's the master of the sea. Bellows his will obey. He your Savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. What a mighty God we serve this morning. Amen. Aren't you thankful for the day that he had mercy and grace on you? Yes. And he lifted you out of the deep miry clay and set your feet on a solid rock to stay this morning. He's able to keep us all the way to the end. Amen. Well, many of you wonder why these great looking young people are sitting up here. Amen. They're coming to sing for us at this time. And then we'll turn the service over to Reverend Goodwin.
this time we'll dismiss our children to the uh, building over there. Go, out, go ahead on out the front and go on over to the building for Children's Church. And the rest of us, you might want to leave with them, but stay here, okay? They, I think they have more fun than we do. That's okay. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Isaiah this morning. Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6. Last week we addressed what it was, and we gave some framework to the concept of missions, God's plan to reach the world through the local church. Missions is not a secondary uh, mission for the church. I don't even think it's a ministry of the church. It is the substance of what the church ought to be doing. A church who fails to understand mission really fails to be useful in the world. Uh, Missions is... Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, both and unto. And so today we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 6. It's interesting because um, while we understand this thing of missions and that it should be the mission of our church, all of the local church is missions. Teaching Sunday school, that's equipping missions. Sharing the gospel, that's home missions, crossing cultural boundaries. If you don't think there's cultural boundaries in your own community, you don't get out enough, all right? There are some. There's different cultures, and we ought to be reaching out with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Planting churches, that's establishing new mission centers. Uh, Sending missionaries, funds, and prayers, that's foreign missions. So the issue then is this. There are still people, though churches are involved, there are still people who could hear the gospel and do not. And I'm not talking about people in other countries. I'm talking about people here. Uh, You'd be surprised at how many times I have a conversation with someone and I ask them just that we'll be talking about God, talking about spiritual things. And I ask them, have have you ever heard the gospel? Do you know what that word means? I like questions. Without questions, you're just shooting in the dark trying to hit something. When you ask questions, sometimes it can help you understand where someone's at. And the number of people who say, no, I don't know what that is. Very religious people, oh yeah, me and God, we have a great relationship, but they've never heard the gospel, then they don't have a relationship with God. Still, there are people who who need that, could hear the gospel, but do not. There are believers who could share the gospel, but do not. There are missionaries who are called to go. I believe there are people who are called to go. You say, why aren't there missionaries going today the same as they used to? Maybe God just isn't calling them. That's not the case. And there are churches who could support more and do not. So the question is, why? Why is that, Pastor? Well, I don't believe we're without love. I don't believe we're without the truth, and I don't believe we're without action. Many times we have that response. We say, I have compassion towards this. I, you know, I, I want to do this. I have the truth. I think many times we lack the passion required for it to become a priority. So I want to take a look at what motivates that passion so that we can embrace our role for missions. Because as I look at the congregation today, some of you might be called to surrender what you're doing and go to a foreign mission field. Really, Pastor? Some of us are seniors. Well, that's okay. Um, Caleb at 80 years old said, I want that mountain. And he took up a sword and God said, go do it. You know, There's plenty of experience. If we still have life and breath, God can use us. In fact, I got a prayer letter from somebody asking to come present. They said they were retired, and and then God called them into foreign missions. It can happen. So I believe that God can impress each one of us how that we ought to be involved in this, and each one of us ought to be praying about that. I believe one thing that will change, uh, change and transform our passion is a clear view of what Isaiah received here in Isaiah 6. In Isaiah 6, the the prophet receives a vision that changes his understanding. You know, it's significant that the Scripture says in the book of Proverbs chapter 29, it says, "...where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he." Now, I've heard that Scripture used incorrectly, meaning that if you don't have a plan for the future, the people perish. In context, that Bible is, that, excuse me, in context, that verse vision there, that's tied back to a prophetic vision from the prophet. In other words, revealed word of God. 
when there is no clear understanding of who God is, who we are in respect to that, and God's plan in the world, guess what? People perish. But he that keepeth the law, that word law speaks of the first five books of the Bible, but expanded to the entire Scripture, he that seeks to keep the Word of God is, is, is plugged into God's Word. Guess what? He has a clear view of who God is, who He is, and God's plan in the world. Happy is He. So I believe that what Isaiah here receives is a clear view of God. It, it changes his understanding, it broadens his theology, it convicts his heart, and it burdens his heart for the world. I believe it can do the same thing for us today. Let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Dear Lord, please help us as we study this passage. Speak to our hearts. Help me as I preach. And dear Lord, I know we've preached through this before. Sharpen it yet again. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. I believe that a proper view of God really fuels a proper view of sin, a right view of self, of our world, and of the need for missions. Notice what Isaiah receives in verses 1 through 4 here. He has a revelation. That word just means to reveal something. It's not speaking of the last book in the Bible. It's just a revealing of who God is. And it's significant once revealed to him about God. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, a king that they had had. And so this was a year of death, not necessarily a time of celebration, but during this time, something was revealed unto him. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train, that would be his garments or the part of his robe, filled the temple. First of all, Isaiah sees the appropriate position of God. Notice the position of God here. God is not brought down to our level, taking away the things that make us feel uncomfortable so He's more relatable. That's not what Isaiah sees, all right? Sometimes we do that today. Let's be careful because God, the appropriate view of God is a place of authority. In the year that the king died, how many times do they greet the king and say, O king, live forever? Well, guess what? Every human king does not. But we worship a God who does. In the year that the king died, guess what? God was still on the throne. And there are tragedies that come and tragedies that go and things that shatter and rock our world and destabilize our country. And we need to remember that we have a God who is still on the throne. Isaiah was reminded of that. And this throne is a position of authority. He is the Lord of all the universe. Uh, He is the only true God. There are those who believe there's many ways to heaven. They say, Uh, Well, I believe heaven is kind of like Walmart. And I say, oh my. Usually I just say, that's interesting. You know, that's my... By the way, if I tell you something's interesting and we're in a conversation, don't think that I'm patronizing you. It might really be interesting. Okay. Probably is. Just don't tell me heaven's like Walmart because then I'll tell you that's interesting. It's nothing like Walmart. They say, it's like Walmart. You know, there's one destination and many roads and that's, that's a lie. It's not. It's through God alone. There's only one God, and His place is of authority and exaltation, high and lifted up. He is above His creation. He has a place of holiness. He is separate from His creation, and yet He is intimately connected. Pastor, how can God be the creator of all, be above all, completely holy, and yet be intimately connected? Well, He didn't ask my permission or yours. He's God, and He tells us what He's like, a personal presence. His train, what does it say? His train filled the, oh, that was kind of weak. His train filled the temple, yes. The temple is a place where Isaiah could fill, and Isaiah said, in this place where I am at, a real physical place, God fills this place. He's imminent. Though He is high and lifted up and separate and holy, He is in him. We, ha- we worship a God who is intimately involved in the workings of His creation. Aren't you glad for that? I'm glad for that. Uh, The Bible says in Matthew 18, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done of my Father which is in heaven. Where two or three are gathered, there am I in their presence. So He is in heaven. He is in our presence. He hears. He answers prayer. His position, though, is, is high and lifted up. Notice His worshipers. 
This is something we could gain uh, from here in our church in the 21st century. Above it stood the seraphims. Uh, The title of these angels speaks of fire. These are angels of fire. Each one had six wings. By the way, this is not your precious moments, angel. It would scare little children. With twain, he covered his face. With twain, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. And the one cried unto the other, these angels who are in the presence of God, in full view of his glory. What do they say about God? They say, holy, holy, holy. In Scripture, three is the number of emphasis. Holy is the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D there is Jehovah. That's what that's translated from. The Lord of hosts. When you... When you notice this word hosts here, in other languages, okay, in Spanish, it's translated the Lord of the armies. It's talking about the armies of heaven, all right? That gains some majestic nature of who God is. The whole earth is full of His glory. So Isaiah sees God for who He is, but then Isaiah is allowed to see some worshipers. These angels were designed from before the creation of the world specifically for the worship of God. So watching how they worship God really can help us learn how to worship God. Are you with me? God, we're fallen in our nature. We do the best we can, and we we do well, and God in His grace says, that's very good, I love you. Okay, you have some room to improve. These angels, they're in the presence of God. They have humble, heartfelt worship. In full view of God's glory, you know what they do? They cover their faces. We're not worthy to look upon the glory of God. Sometimes in our modern day, we want to bring God down to our level so much that we strip away His glory, trying to make us more like ourselves so He's more relatable to the modern world. You know, God never did that. If if you're reading the Scripture, He didn't do that. He's high and lifted up. And these angels, normally we think of them with two wings. These have six. Uh, Wings communicate swiftness. These angels in the view of God are humble. They're swift to do the will of God. They cover their fate, face and their feet, utter humility. And, and notice what they, by the way, a proper view of God's will, I think it motivates humility and service. They were willing to do what God wanted them to do immediately. It's significant in your New Testament, one of the words translated worship is other, well, other places translated Service. When you serve God from the heart, it is accepted as worship. Notice what these these, uh, angels do. They worship God and they say, holy, 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 verse 3. As they praise God, what's the one thing that they praise about God? You know, all these praise and worship songs written about God. Some are very good, all right? Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are songs being written today that are good songs. We should evaluate each one. They have a good message. We can, we can agree with them if they speak truth. Praise God for that. But many of them are so watered down, they could be speaking about your next door neighbor or somebody's boyfriend or talking about God. That is not how that we should be worshiping God. God is holy. And let's make sure that songs speak truth about God. And, and the one thing that transcends all other characters of God is His holiness. The whole earth is filled with the glory of who this God is. Everywhere they looked, they could see this. As you know, the psalmist also said this. He said, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare. The angels said, the earth is full. So if the heavens and the earth are full of God's glory, guess what? Every place you look, you should see the glory of God if you're connected with God. His worshipers recognize that. That's an appropriate worship of God. Ultimate humility, heartfelt uh, humility, willingness to to serve, worshiping God's holiness. That's what should be taking place in worship services, by the way. Amen? 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 And His place, the temple, was full of worship. Look at verse 4. I love this. As they were crying, the temple was filled with who God is. They recognized it. They worshiped Him. And they worshiped him so loud, the posts of the doors moved at the voice of him that cried. These angels were singing, so they, bare, they almost raised the roof, all right? Wow. The house was filled with smoke, the evidence of who God is. That's how we should worship God. When you come to church, let me challenge you. You say, Pastor, I can't sing. Well, that's not really true. You can't sing to modern um, 
ideas of performance-rated singing, all right? Did you know that when God wants you to sing, He doesn't want you to perform? Make a joyful, I can do that. So can you, I've heard you. All He requires is that it be joyful and from the heart. And you know what? We should be will- He died for us. We should be willing to praise Him. Now, I'm not making fun of your singing. I'm not shaming you. But friend, don't, don't feel held back by certain metrics of the world has, all right? When these kids come up here and sing and they sing to the Lord, praise God for that. Amen. When, when somebody preaches or serves or if it's from the heart, God receives it. And so we should be willing to do that as an act of worship to God with our whole self. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your body, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, just reasonable. His place was full of the worship. How should we sing, Pastor? Well, with all that we are. Psalm 97, the Scripture says, "'The Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of the isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are around Him, righteousness and judgment are the habitations of His throne. A fire goeth before Him and burneth up His enemies round about.'" If there's anything in your life that is worthy extolling and and giving glory to, it's the God of heaven. And I'll say this, I'll park here for just a moment more. Some of us find it easier to glorify other things in our life than we do the God of heaven because we know the response of the world around us. And we know that if I glorify God too much, people aren't going to like it. It's going to make them uneasy. Well, guess what? We don't glorify God for them. We glorify God for Him. And when we come together to worship God, you know why these angels were worshiping God? Because it's an act of service to God. Worship is primarily not for the worshiper, but for the one being worshiped. Do we understand that? Um, I'll say this gently. I heard a preacher say this, you know, I was listening to one of his sermons, and uh, a person left and they said, Pastor, I did not enjoy the worship service today. And the pastor said, that's fine. We weren't worshiping you. Now, is it possible to be in a church service and the Spirit is not there? Absolutely. There are places with the word church on their building and things don't happen to the glory of God. But let us not forget that we come to worship Him. And when we do that, you know what it does? It prepares our heart for the rest of what's to come. Worship is an act of service to the one being worshiped. And when you have an accurate view of God, we can do no other than to just sacrifice ourselves at the feet of the cross, to sing with our heart from our... Let your songs be a song of prayer. And when we step outside, some of you guys think when Sam and I step out, it's to talk about church members. Did you see them people that came in? Yeah, they haven't been here forever. Yeah, shame on them. You know, who else isn't here? No, we step out there. And the thing I pray most frequently is, God, help our songs to be a prayer unto you. That as we sing, it is to God and God alone. This vision of God, though, it leads to several conclusions. First, it leads to the conclusion our God is holy and exalted. And by the way, when you see what true holiness is, everything else becomes clear. It gives perspective to the things that we thought were holy. And we say, wow, I guess it really wasn't as good as I thought it was. Our unholiness is revealed. It reveals that God will judge sin. It reveals a problem with all people. We are sinners separated from this God due to our sin, deserving punishment for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I think secondly, it leads us to the conclusion that God is worthy of all praise and worship. He deserves, by the way, if God deserves that from the angels and He deserves that from you, do you realize that He deserves worship from the people who don't know Him yet? So how are we going to solve that? They need to know Him, right? Well, very very soon, Isaiah is going to respond to that. Look at his repentance of sin. The first thing Isaiah does, he sees God, and then he's very aware of his own shortcomings. Verse 5, then said I, after his view of God, God's holiness, God's, God's glory, the worship of God, he all of a sudden comes to a sense of self-awareness and says, Oh, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm finished. I'm as good as dead. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Isaiah, how do you know that? Well, 
Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It made him aware of how fallen he really was. A prophet? He was a good man, but not perfect. By the way, when somebody tells you, well, nobody's perfect, the answer can be, that's the point. Yeah, we're not, but God (laughs) requires that. See, Isaiah, when he saw true holiness, it resulted in humble repentance, and he sees the guilt of his own sin. I am a man of unclean lips. He realizes that his mouth is guilty of sin. Jesus said, that which proceedeth forth out of the mouth comes forth from the heart, and that defileth a man. And friend, remember this, we're all fallen sinners, and if something comes out of your mouth, guess what? It was in the heart to start with. Now, whether it was volitional, whether it just came out, It was inside to start with, and so it's a heart problem. And you know who can cleanse the heart? That's right. I'm so glad for that. God can take care of that. Don't deny it. Instead, repent of it. He sees the sin in his own life, and then he sees the sin in society. By the way, he doesn't just point his finger at society and say, wow, God is holy, and all them people, they're not. But at least I'm a little bit better than them. If you feel that way then maybe you need to go back and examine how holy God is. Because the fact is, we're all sinners. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. We can say that today. And these are tied to an accurate view of God. When we see glory and holiness, we cannot help but see sin for what it is. Seeing true purity contrasts and reveals impurity. By the way, when you fail to see God for who He is, we downplay our own faults. I was just born that way. It's not a big deal. You know, it's just a my my family. I've always been this way. It's a sin, friend. It's a character flaw. We're fallen. We're not like Christ. The degree to which we're not like Christ is the degree to which we need to change. And we fail, secondly, to see the sin in the world around us. Oh, it's a psychological problem. It's a sickness that can be solved through medication or psychology. Oh, it's just cultural. Well, I got news for you. A lot of sins are tied to culture. But Christ came to forgive those too. Amen? Amen? And so the response should be repentance and confession. That word repentance is a tricky word. Sometimes people misunderstand the full force. The word simply means a change of the mind, an inner man. And so he recognizes sin for what it is. And you know what it leads him to do? It leads him to confess. Look at verse 6. Then flew, he says, I, I'm, mine eyes have seen the Lord of hosts, and he, he confesses his sin for what it is, and God brings forgiveness. Forgiveness follows confession. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me. These who had been worshiping God, all of a sudden they break off and they look at Isaiah and they go, yeah, you are unclean. We got to do something about that. And they took a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar, the altar that is in front of God in heaven, and he laid it on my mouth And said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away and purged. Now, Isaiah, he was a prophet. The function of the prophet was to take the message from God and give it to the people. And so he would come to the people and he would represent God to the people. He would say, Thus saith the Lord. And they would look at him and receive God's words. The priest functioned in the opposite direction. He would go to the people, he would take their sin, and he would bring it before God and say, God, these are the people's sins. So they functioned in opposite directions. This prophet who would be bringing God's word to the people, don't you think it's important that his mouth be clean? Yeah, absolutely. See, he wasn't prepared to take God's word to the people until his mouth was purified from sin. And his sin was purified by sacrifice. That's what's on the altar there. Notice the progression. He had a view of God which showed him holiness then a view of self, which showed him his unholiness. His response was conviction. He responded with repentance. I am, I changed my mind. This is, I recognize it. And he confessed it. The word confession means to agree with. It doesn't mean to excuse. When you confess your sins to God, don't say, God, I'm sorry for what I did. I've always been this way. Please forgive me. That's not a confession. A true confession, I work with my kids on this. A true confession is to agree with the reality of what you've done. Lord, I am a sinner. I did this, and please forgive me. You're you're agreeing that it's wrong. What does the Scripture say about confession? If we confess our sins, He is 
to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. By the way, 1 John 1, 9 is not a salvation verse. It is a verse written to people who are already saved that we should be cleaning house on a regular basis. Clean the house, open the door, shed the light on it, say, it's there, clean this dirt out, Lord, please help me, and He'll forgive us. And so God did. By the way, I fear what many Christians, what prevents them from taking God's message to the lost is they have unconfessed sin in their heart. Their mouth is not ready. We need to be willing to admit our sin for what it is. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 139. Sometimes, sometimes there's dirt. You ever had dirt in your closet and you didn't know it was there? Yeah. And, and all of a sudden you're moving things around. You didn't even know that was there. It needed to be revealed to you. Did you know that God will help you do that? God's Holy Spirit lives inside you. He wants you to be clean. The psalmist says in Psalm 139, that psalm talks about how that God is omniscient and He knows, thou knowest my downsitting, mine uprising, they're acquainted with all my ways, you know my thought afar off, and, and you know everything. These ways are too high for me. I can't attain unto them, the psalmist says. And then in the end of the psalm, after talking about how wise and knowledgeable God knows everything, the psalmist says, search me, O God. And know my heart. There are things in my life that I've become blind to. We know what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, where he talks about the person, you know, why do you judge your brother? You find a moat in his eye and there's a beam in your own. It's It's a ridiculous picture, but the fact is we can find little character flaws in other people and pick them apart. And meanwhile, we've got this glaring thing in our life that we ignore because we've become blind to it. It's too close for us to see it. You know who can reveal that? God can. Yeah. James says that the Word of God is like a mirror, and as you look in a mirror, it reveals these things. So the psalmist prays to God, search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Reveal it so that I can repent of it, confess it, you can purify it, and then I can go in the way that you want me to go. This is, in essence, what, the, what Isaiah does. And then, only then, is Isaiah impressed with the calling to the lost. Look at verse 8. So he sees God for who he is. He sees himself. And instead of excusing, instead of mis- he repents and confesses. God purifies him. And all at once, Isaiah is aware of something. This conversation in heaven about God wanting to reach the lost. Also, also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? You know we worship a triune God? You know there's conversations within the Trinity? Yeah, Yeah, you should be willing to accept that and spot it in the Scripture. Yeah. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, capital W. That's an individual. And the Word was with God, so that's two individuals, and the Word was God. By the way, that the word there is not, the, is not the Scripture, okay? There's many parallels between Jesus and the Scripture, but it's talking about an individual because the Word was made flesh, John 1, 14, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's talking about God the Son, two persons there, but we also know there's a Holy Spirit. And there's a conversation here in the Old Testament that Isaiah is witnessing. God says, who shall go for us? Now, later he'd send his Son, Jesus Christ. But guess what? He wants to send you. Now, he never breaks and talks to Isaiah. Isaiah witnesses this. Isaiah's there in the presence of God, and God is speaking to himself. Maybe he's speaking to the angels. God doesn't send the angels to evangelize. Have you ever ever wondered why? Because he sent you, and he sent me. That's right. He says, who shall go for us? A heavenly conversation. And Isaiah is kind of standing there, and I I can just imagine this in my sanctified imagination, okay? Isaiah's in this. I don't know if he was asleep, because he just says he saw this. I don't know if he was asleep or if he was in a vision, if this was a dream, if he was in the temple, because he's aware of what's filling the temple. I don't know. By the way, wait till you get to heaven and ask Isaiah. That'd be kind of neat, wouldn't it? But he's there, and he's observing this conversation with God in real time, And it's almost like Isaiah's looking around and he realizes there's nobody else to go, but I'm here. God, I'll go. And at that point, God addresses him. He, God, said, 
Isaiah, you'll go. Then go. Go and tell this people. See, I think many times all that's required is for our eyes to be open for us to realize that we do fit into God's plan to reach the world. Every single one of you. It, Pastor, I, you know, I just, I haven't been to Bible college. Neither had Isaiah. They hadn't invented it yet. That's right. Well, I can't remember all the scripture references. That's okay. That's not a requirement. Um, I, I can't do this or I can't do that. You know, there was, this, there was a guy in the Bible who had a lot of excuses. God called him to go, and God met with him in a burning bush, and God said, I want you to go and do this. And he says, blah, 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 I, I, I can't. And the Lord said, I'm the Lord. Um, all you need is me, but I don't have anything. God said, what's in your hand there? And he goes, oh, just this stick. And God said, okay, I'll use that stick. Fine, I'll use the stick. Listen, if you've got a stick and a voice, you can do something. God doesn't require you to go to the foreign mission field, but each one of us requires something. Each one of us has something. Sorry. We can serve God where we're at. I, I spoke with someone this last week. I feel like God's moving me to, to serve Him in a greater capacity. Well, let's start by serving Him where you're at, your sphere of influence. You come, listen, every single person here, you come in contact with unsaved people in some way on a regular basis. You're not a pastor. That's okay. You're not a missionary. That's okay. Can you be an influence? Can you show the love of Christ? Can you pass them a track? Can you begin to build a relationship with? Well, pastor, I'm antisocial. Okay, then, then maybe we know your challenge where you need to pray that God would help you. Well, I'm an introvert. That's okay. Can you hand a track? Even introverts, you're not exempt from this. All right. So each one of us, pastor, by the way, you can pray. I don't go out much. You're watching us through live stream and you don't contact many people. Well, that's okay. You can pray. You can give. There's many different ways to be involved in this. You can support the local church, the, the arena of missions now. And I think it's significant the way that Isaiah witnessed this. Isaiah, he witnessed God first. Then he witnessed himself. He responded with confession. And then he said, the world needs truth. God is holy. I'm a sinner. God, forgive me and prepare me, and then let me go. And listen, church, it's very important that you and I get that in the right order. Here's why. Because our philosophy and our ministry depends on it. If we look inward and we say, wow, I'm really bad, and then we look upward, we're more likely to form a God in our own image. If we look upward and we say, God's really holy, but we never look inward, and all we do is look outward, we say, God's really holy, the world's really unholy. And we never realize that we're just like they are. You know what that results in? Evangelism without grace and love. Yeah. If we look inward and then outward, we really don't know what holiness is. And we'll say, well, they're not any worse than I am. You know, I just got I, I to gotta reframe these issues of sin. And maybe it's just, maybe I just need to update. The Bible's too outdated. And sin is, you know, these are, you know, Paul was misogynistic. And the Bible doesn't really talk about these things. And I need to update the Bible. That's wrong. All right. And so we need to be careful in the way that we respond. After Isaiah saw God for who he was, saw self for who he was, responded with the offer, all it required was God said, okay, you're offering? Great, let's go. Look at the commandment, verse 9. Go with the message. Go and tell this people. Verse 9. He said, go and tell this people. Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. By the way, I love this. Sometimes folks will say, well, pastor, I, I can't really witness today because people don't respond to the gospel. That doesn't keep you from sharing it. <laughs> I, I say that gently. Their rejection really can't prevent me from sharing it. At least when God calls you to share it, he doesn't tell you ahead of time, oh, by the way, I want you to share it, but everybody's going to reject it. Because that's what he tells Isaiah. Isaiah. He says, go and tell, but the people aren't, they're going to hear, but they're not going to understand. Oh, well, that's real encouraging. I want you to go plant a church, pastor, and you're going to go to this area and you're going to work, but nobody's going to understand what you're saying. And you're going to, they're going to see, but they're not going to perceive. Their heart is going to be fat. Something that's fat has been filled up. It's a picture of you've fed them so much that their heart is full and they still aren't hearing or feeling. 
You're making their ears heavy. If you could put stuff in somebody's ear to where their ear was heavy, that's the picture, right? And they still aren't listening. Sometimes you do that with your kids. You feel like you're talking to them, and I've said this a million times, you know, and it's still not getting through. Their eyes, they shut their eyes, like some people do in church, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and be converted and healed. And he says, Isaiah, you're going to go, and the vast majority of people aren't going to listen, but I still want you to go. Amen? Amen? We say, Pastor, that's not very successful. By by whose metrics? These, These seraphims are worshiping in the presence of God. Who hears that? Well, only Isaiah and God. Was their worship successful, church? What if Isaiah never heard it and only God heard it? Was it still successful? So maybe we need to dial back and recalibrate our metrics for success when it comes to engaging the world and being an influence. If you are obeying God, regardless of how others respond, your obedience was successful. Are you with me? Yeah. That's a lot less discouraging because the Lord sees it. So Isaiah says, okay, God, I'm going to be preaching, and they're not going to listen. I'm going to fill up their ears, and I'm going to fill up their hearts, and they're just going to fall asleep in the service. Well, how long should I do this? Verse 10, then said I, Lord, how long? How long do you want me to go on this mission trip? And God says, well, I'm glad you asked. He answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant. I want you to preach to the people till there's no more people. (laughs) Okay. Till the houses be without man and the land be utterly desolate. That's going to happen because when they reject the truth, at least they have the truth. God will hold them accountable for it. And the Lord have removed men far away. By the way, this is a specific prophecy to the nation of Israel. They did have the truth. They rejected the truth. God judged them, set them aside. He will restore them. But I want you to notice the parallel. He, he does promise a tenth shall return. God will restore it. So the, I, the question is, how long am I supposed to keep preaching this message? The message of Jesus Christ, the message that men are sinners. You know, there's a tendency when, when society changes to water down the truth, to remove the elements that are, that are offensive and convicting. Oh, you can't say that. That's, that's hate speech. Well, I'm sorry, but if it's true, it's not hateful. It's loving. We should speak the truth in love, but truth is an absolute. Love is a, is a motivation. It's a mannerism. The medicine still has to be delivered. And if you change the medicine, the person's not going to get well. Amen. Society doesn't want to hear about sin. They don't want to hear about hell or man's needs. They want to hear, oh, you can live your best life now by maximizing and praising. That's self-worship. That's idolatry. That's not the gospel. Don't water down the truth. Don't change the truth. Don't minimize the truth. Speak the truth, for the time will come when men shall not endure sound doctrine, but they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and turn themselves away from the truth. And so you and I have a limited window. You say, Pastor, what if they reject it? That's okay, because in this same book, take your Bible and turn over to Isaiah 55. God speaks to this same prophet. If you can tell I'm passionate about that, that's because... This is true, Isaiah 55. Look at what the Scripture says here. Verse 7, regardless of reception, friend, when you, when you are an influence, let thy, let thy uh, light so shine before men that they might see your good works. That is a form of, of that, living a Christian life and then speaking. By the way, somebody can't get saved just because you live a Christian life. Right. That's the platform for you to share the message. Amen. Isaiah 55, look at verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, Isaiah 55, 7, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. This is a stern message for those who are away from the Lord. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. We would say to the wicked who's away from God, God, smite him. World out there, I just want you to, how many of you have prayed for God to smite somebody in traffic or maybe a neighbor or maybe a politician? That's what our flesh wants to do. By the way, some of, some of Jesus' disciples says, Lord, call down fire from heaven on these people. And he says, you're too, you're too rough. I came to seek and to save the lost. He says here, God will abundantly pardon. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Here's the way that God's ways are, okay? As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. So just obey what he says. Well, how does the word work? Okay, here's how it works. As the rain comes down from 
comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither. You don't see uh, raindrops bouncing off the ground and coming back up. We understand a circulatory cycle. It's not negating that. But what happens is the water falls, it hits the ground, it sinks in, and it produces something. It waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud. When the water falls and it waters your grass, guess what? It takes a little while for the effect to be seen, does it not? It must sink in, it must nourish the grass. It takes a little while, but the effect always happens, not instantly, not in the way you would anticipate, but it happens according to God's working in the invisible things underneath. You can see the rain, you can see the grass, you can see the effect, but you don't see what God is doing. It's hidden, it's higher. And so God says this, that it may bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my, what's that next word? Word Word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. You've got a whole book of it right there, Christian. And he says this, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that whither I please and prosper in the thing whither to I sent it. Christian, don't let the reception of the world disarm or discourage you from serving God and sharing the truth. Be like the sower who just casted the seed out. He casted it and it fell in different places. He was not discriminate, you know? Amen. By the way, if you share God's word, you're obedient. If you share and live God's Word, you've done what He's called you to do, and if you share and live God's Word, it's going to work even after you're gone. God's Holy Spirit, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and dividing to the soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I've witnessed it many times when I speak to someone and they don't want to hear the truth, and that's okay. Don't be threatened. Don't get upset. It's all right. People have things they want to believe. I, I, don't, I don't know how many of you guys accepted the gospel the first time you heard it. You ever thought about that? If you got saved as an adult, how many times did you have to hear the gospel before you got saved? Yeah, probably a lot. Some of us are a little hard-headed than others, okay? So be patient with people. Love them to Jesus but speak the truth in love. Pastor, how am I motivated to do that? Well, we have to realize that God is worthy of all praise. He's he's holy. He's the only God that's real. There's a lot of people that are worshiping a bunch of false gods. The self-esteem movement, they're worshiping self. Secular humanism today in the schools, they're worshiping who knows what. They're being told that all religions are equal and everything is the same. That, that doesn't even make sense. They could all be wrong, but they can't all be right. right. Amen. There are people locked into religions believing very sincerely, but they've never accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They can't worship the one true God who is holy, who will judge sin. And you know what? You and I should be willing to say, I'm a sinner. It's not that I'm better than them, but I'm forgiven and I have the truth. God, purify and cleanse me so my mouth can speak the truth. And then we become aware that, yeah, God does want to reach the world and He's conversing with it. Who am I going to sin? I don't... I'll do it. Maybe He's just waiting for you to volunteer. Sometimes we pray for the lost, not realizing that we're the answer to our own prayers. Yeah. I want you to think about this this coming week. We're praying about missions. We have missions candidates who God has called, who have responded, and are simply trying to get to the mission field or continue their work. Praise God for that. Each one of us can have a part, a small part. Pastor, I don't have much. That's okay. I don't know if I can give anything. That's okay. That's between you and the Lord. By the way, Jesus sat in the treasury and he watched a widow come and put money in there. She gave two pennies and he was impressed. He said that's all she had. We can all be involved. We can pray, we can give. And by the way, each one of us should be praying about how we're going to go. Pray about that. As this missions conference progresses, pray about your burden for the lost. Pray about your burden for your own sin. And and I said that I was going to get to this point as I close. I'm in closing right now. Each one of us should have... I want to challenge you to think about this. Maybe I'll just finish this way. Each one of us should have at least one person who is unsaved, who we we are burdened for, and we regularly take before the throne of grace. 
Do you realize how much it would revolutionize the kingdom of God if every Christian only, each year, only led one person to Christ? If all we did was one person to Christ, I don't know how many we have in here, 100 people, maybe a little bit more than that. That would double our number by the end of this year. Now, they may not all come to independent. That's okay. <laughs> they don't have to. But do you realize what that would do if we kept that up? That's just one a year. That's really low bar. Amen. God wants to use you to do so much more. And He can if we just open this and have a burden here, see Him for who He is, and give ourselves as a living sacrifice. Amen. That's the motivation for missions this morning. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. If God has spoken to your heart this morning, I want you to pray, God, how would you use me? I'll go. I'll do. I don't know. But whatever you call me to, I'll do it. Impress on my heart. And then, church member, if God calls you, if God motivates, if He moves, if it's a good thing but it feels like it's too big for you, it's probably what God's calling you to do then do it by God's strength. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your people today and their attentiveness. Move in our hearts. In your name I pray, amen. Stand to our feet, heads bowed and eyes closed. If God has spoken to your heart this morning, friend, do business with God during this invitation time. Amen. Very glad you're saved today. Amen. I am too. I am too. I'm going to ask Brother Jerry Ayers, would you close us in a word of prayer this morning, after which you'll be dismissed. We ask this as we go from here, Holy Son of Jesus.